Amen and amen. God bless you as you're giving, and uh, thank you for that. Let me introduce you or welcome you to the harbor. If you don't know me, I'm Mike Sains. I'm the lead pastor here, and it's my privilege to have you with us. And, um, and it's also my privilege to welcome you to the GOAT series. And again, I don't want you to think we're going to be praying to no goat or anything like that. Matter of fact, I, I had to uh, even ask some of my staff what, what they meant when they said the GOAT series, because I was a little bit in the dark about this too, because I have hit 50 and things slow down a little bit, they say. But anyway, um, they said, Pastor, that's the greatest of all time. And I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't even know I was in that category nowhere. And they said, well, no, no, not you, but some of the messages you preached <laughs> uh, stood out to them as some of the greatest of all time. And so I, I want to uh, be faithful to the Lord. I, obviously, I do. And so for, for those of you who have been with me for many, many years, I've been here 22 years, you might say, well, man, I think I've heard that message before. Well, let me just remind you, them songs we just sang, you've probably heard them before, too. But you still worship and praise the Lord. Are you with me? Say Amen. So today I want to just um, embark upon a message that's, uh, man, it, it's powerful. Built this message back in 2007 to preach at my pastor's church in Tifton uh, in a revival that was just incredible. And, and the title is Losing the Image of God. Now I want to, if I may, just sort of break this down because first... Um, in chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 27, the Bible says, and I guess I'll just take this for my text, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. So you and I were created in the image and the likeness of God. Now, image is a biblical description of the unique nature of human beings in our unique relationship with our creator, God. We, mankind, was created to be the apple of God's eye and the highest order of all creation. In fact, when he created mankind, he put us in the garden over all the earth and gave us dominion. And um, so he says, let us make them in our image. Scholars through the age of have, ages have sought to unravel that mystery uh, or that statement when, when, and the psalmist asked this question, you know, that, that statement about being made in the likeness of God, the image of God. We've tried to unpack that and unravel that, and everybody's sort of given a stab at it. David even said, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man that you would visit him? But you've made us a little bit lower than the angels and crowned us, if you will, with glory and honor. Philosophers have thought about it. Theologians have debated it. Psychologists have reasoned. Uh, anthropologists have certainly talked about it. And all of them have realized that the human being is what David said, fearfully and wonderfully Made. When the sperm reaches the egg, all of a sudden a trillion cells goes to work, everyone doing the job that they're supposed to, and after 40 weeks of gestation, there is a beautiful baby boy or girl, fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God, a special creation according to scriptures. Humans are not evolutionary uh, accident as some would purport or just all of a sudden something that just spontaneously combusted. But we were a special creation where God literally took dust of the earth and formed us and then breathed life into our nostrils and man became a living soul. And he gives us a span of life and he says when that span is over, the body will go back to the earth from the dust it came and the spirit will return to the God that gave it. And I submit that is Yahweh, God, Jehovah, amen. So human beings were purposely produced by God to fulfill a preordained role in this world. They have a particular or peculiar quality that somehow reflect the nature of God himself and set us apart and away from every other created being on earth. So let's talk about image and likeness, if we will, for a moment. Bible students have tried to make the distinction between image and and likeness. Matter of fact, uh, I, I'm looking at my, my image right here. You're looking at your image. 
you see. The, we're made in the image and in the likeness of God. He says, but, but they, they, they strive over these words. Some maintain that humankind in the fall retained the image but lost the likeness. Let me try to define it. Image is considered the essential nature of God. Uh, you know that we have the essential nature of God just by being his created. Likeness, they say, as reflecting the image of God in such qualities as goodness and grace and love and tenderness and all of that. So the, the two words seem to identify the same act. But repetition here shows us that Hebrew uh, parallelism, if you will, and that style that's used for emphasis. And so let me give you two illustrations that might help us understand likeness and, and image. Number one comes from the Hebrew word selim. It, it means image. It refers to something hewn or carved. For instance, if you were to go to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, then you would see a statue of Bear Bryant. And it bears a semblance of the bear. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Complete with the hat and all of that good stuff. A strong physical resemblance. Now, on the other hand, likeness comes from a word, demuth. It literally means a facsimile. That is, uh, in other words, an exact copy of. So there is a difference here that we're talking. In other words, watch this. There is a likeness between us and God, but not a sameness. You understand? There's a likeness. There's some similarities, but there's not the sameness. We are not God. In fact, right now, we are frail because we are mortal. Amen? And the Bible says in John 4 that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, yes, he breathed his spirit into us, but we still have to deal with this thing called flesh. If you don't believe it, just pinch yourself real quick. Or your neighbor. So I want to, if I may this morning, deal with about three facts, and I need to unpack this. Um, some, some facts, that is, the image of God, that, that uh, Latin word is the imago Dei. It is the condition in which humans were created in the image of God. It let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and so God created them. Male and female created them. Now, there's three different views of us being made in the image of God. The first view of being made in the image of God is the structural view. So if you're a note taker, this might be a good place for you. The structural view talks about the physical resemblance that man has toward God. In other words, we, we see things like Moses uh, when he says, Has the Lord's hand Wax short. In other words, we see that anthropomorphic language, you know, uh, ascribing uh, hands to God. Is the eye of the Lord dim that it cannot see? Is, has the ear of the Lord grown heavy that it cannot hear? Our worship is a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. You understand this anthropomorphic language where we liken him, even though he is a spirit, to a human being. When he walked on water, implying that he had feet that moved. and Y'all understand what I'm saying. When we talk about God, the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, the writer of Chronicles said. Isaiah said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. His ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. Are you with me? Say amen. Amen. So then we, we, we think about things where they heard from heaven the day John baptized Jesus. Heaven's open and they heard the voice of God saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. So we see the voice of God. We've seen the heart of God. Daniel said, I saw him sitting upon the throne with a hoary head of hair, white that is. So we see all this language that defines him as something that we are made in the similitude of or the likeness or image of. And uh, it's, just, it's amazing. So it's a structural view. 
There is another view. It's called the relational view. And it holds that, that we retain the image of God as long as we are in a relationship with God. But because of the fall, how many of you know the original sin, the fall of man? You remember Eden uh, in the garden when Eve was deceived and took of the fruit and she gave to her husband and he also took the fruit and, and that is original sin and God came down and pushed them out of the garden. He put a curse upon the serpent. He said, upon thy belly you'll crawl all the days of your life and I'll put enmity between you and the seed of mankind so that he'll bruise your head and you'll bruise his heel. That's why so many of y'all don't like snakes today and I'm one of you. Amen. He said the earth is cursed. It will not yield its strength. You wonder why you got to buy so much fertilizer and ammonia and all of that stuff because the earth does not yield its strength anymore. He said the, the earth has also been cursed and thorns and thistles have infested the grounds. That's why rose bushes have thorns now. That's why blackberries have thorns now. But there will come a day when the curse will be removed. Are y'all hearing me? And thorns will no longer infest the ground. Amen. And childbearing won't hurt in the eternal kingdom of God. Woo, I mean, that's real deep right there now. That is real deep. I don't have time to go there, but because of the fall, someone says, the image of God, that that I could look at and see God in somehow, not that I'm God, but, but, but I've got a hand and God's got a hand. I've got eyes and God's got eyes. I've got nostrils and God's got nostrils. But some have said, because of uh, the fall, I no longer have any of these things that I would submit to you. There is still some similitude. There's still something. Yes, we did lose something awesome and something great at the garden. You know, for those who hold this view, the relational view, the image of God existed in the original righteousness. But because of the original sin, we lost our original status of righteous. We are no longer without sin. And it is sin that has separated us from God. <clears throat> We lost that original righteousness. We lost that image of God. Thus the fall has perverted us. And and what we look like forevermore, our capability to reason, our volition, all of that, we may have retained some of these things, but otherwise we have been depraved, some have said. So that was the structural view, looking the hands and the feet of God and the head and the nostrils and legs and feet. And then the relational view, it said, as long as you're in a right relationship with God, You've still got the image and the likeness. But, however, because of the fall of man, we lost that. And then there's another view. It's called the dynamic view of, of, of God. And this view asserts that even though we have lost the image of God through the fall of sin, it can be restored again by the work of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. Amen. Because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And who can come to God? But yet first they be drawn by the Holy Spirit. And they come by way of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He's the only way to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he said. So, for the Son of Man, Luke 19 and 10, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Yes, I might have lost some of the image of God. I might have lost some of the likeness and some of the similitudes. But if I'll submit myself to the mighty hand of God, if I'll accept the work done at Calvary, He can come and do something in me. Now, I want you to understand, there's some things that we're not going to get on this side at all. I don't care how saved you are. And how royal you claim that blood. Mine's O positive. Matter of fact, I got more than most. Every now and then they take a little bit off. But what I want to tell you is that no matter what I say about my blood and how clean I think I am, I am still human being. I'm still flesh and I'm still struggling with this old life and this thing called sin that came into the garden. And it is the sin that we have to struggle with to maintain that image of God. 
So uh, let me move on. The proponents of this view of the image of God is neither the present structure of the human person with hands and feet and ears, nor the idyllic past in our relationship to God lost by Adam, but yet restored in Christ. Instead, this view looks toward the future that says the divine image is our goal and it is our destiny. And when this life is finished, I'm going to walk into that place called heaven. Amen. I'm going to arrive at that place that I have worked for all my life. So regardless of whatever view you claim to choose or choose to hold on to, the fact remains that when mankind fell, we fell hard. The impact was incredible upon the image that was in us. To the extent that image was affected will be debated until Jesus comes again. However, we know that sin brought separation with it. We know that the fall of man brought us in a difficult relationship. For from the time man was put out of the garden... We could no longer be in the presence of God. So God put a flaming, uh, 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 a cherub angel with a flaming sword at the gate of the Garden of Eden so that mankind could not come back in. Amen? And we were separated from God. And occasionally we would see things where Moses talked to God face to face. Where where Joshua or where Jacob met him at Peniel or Phineuel. Where we see things like that. But by and large, that relationship we had with him. Where he came down and walked in the garden with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Was over and gone. Those kinds of talks. And walks would be no more for thousands of years. In fact, from the Garden of Eden all the way to Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he told the thief that day, he said, This day thou shalt be with me where? In paradise. Why? Because it's their sins that have separated them from God. And even those who got forgiveness and remission of sins they still could not be in the presence of God so they were in a place called paradise if you study the scripture heaven obviously is here hell is in the core of the earth but there was a great gulf there was a great chasm where heaven was on the one side Hell, not heaven, I'm sorry, paradise on the one side uh, and hell on the other side with a great gulf. There's a scripture, you can check it out in Luke uh, 16 at some later point. But the Bible says there was a a, 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 a man by the name of Lazarus. He was a beggar. He was filled with sores. He was oozing with corruption. He died. He wanted to eat from the rich man's table. He wouldn't even give him the crumbs. But one day he died. And the Bible says angels carried him where? to paradise, to lay on the bosom of Abraham. Who's Abraham? The father of faith. Abraham come after the Garden of Eden. Are you with me? So there he is. And all of these men that died of old, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Joel and Micah and all of these gospel greats, these all these great men are a place called paradise. But on, on that cross that day, This thief says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus mustered the courage to turn and say, this day thou shalt be with me. Where? In paradise. You know why? John the Revelator would give us a little bit of insight when Jesus came back from the grave on the third day when he showed himself. You know what? He said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and yet I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of hell. You know what I've done? He said, Paul said, who is he that ascended up on high? Talking about Jesus. But first, descended to the lower parts and preached deliverance to the captives that was held in a place called paradise. The devil couldn't hurt them, but he had them locked up. And the Bible says Jesus come and took the keys and said, no longer. Why? Because what I just did at Calvary, my blood, for you are not redeemed with uh, corruptible things like silver or gold, but you have been redeemed by the precious blood of a spotless lamb. John the Revelator said, slain from the foundation. Jesus took his blood and paid the eternal price for everybody who would ever sin, no matter what it is. 
So sin could no longer, after Jesus Christ gave his blood and applied that blood to the mercy seat, I'm going to tell you the price was paid in full. The gates had to be opened up. And I believe he told the old devil, you know what the Bible says? There comes a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. I believe that day when Jesus went down there, I think he made old Satan practice. I believe he said, give me those keys, boy. I believe he just had to go ahead and practice one time because he had to let them go. He had been holding them for thousands of years. Some of you say, I don't know about that, Pastor. Well, I'm glad you're a gospel person. How about Matthew 27? In Matthew 27, that's New Testament. The Bible says, when the veil of the temple was rent in twain, because Jesus Christ had become the ultimate sacrifice, the propitiation for our sin. When he fulfilled that and he became that ultimate sacrifice, he said the veil was rent from top to bottom. Amen. There is no more holy of holies. Man, before then, only the high priest could come one time a year to meet in, with God in the presence of God. He said, but now all of you can come boldly to the throne of God to obtain grace to help in time of need. Well, the temple has been rent in twain. It has moved apart. Those who were captive from, from God could not be. They've been released. In Matthew 27, I didn't forget. The Bible says they went to check the cemetery and the graves of great men like Abraham. I, the, the saints of old, the grave had busted open and they saw them walking on the streets of Jerusalem. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13 when he said the trumpet of the Lord is going to sound and the dead in Christ is going to rise. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Just as surely as the first resurrection when Jesus brought, captive, uh, brought captivity out and gave gifts to men. And those graves bursted open. And we've not only got the Bible saying it. We've got historians like Eusebius. And like Philo. And like Josephus. If you just want to check them out. Those people independent of the Bible. Said man graves had busted open. They, they said we saw the saints of old. These guys walking around. And you know how long they stayed? Till Jesus raised his hands. And said Lord give me power to ascend back from whence I came. And the last words he told you and me was, I'll be back. Angel said, why stand ye here gazing into the heaven, you men of uh, Jerusalem? Why stand gazing into the heaven for this same Jesus that you have seen go in like manner shall come again? Lord, have mercy. I, I got to go on. But somebody else wonders why Jesus, was in the, you know, he was, he was in the heart of the earth. Here's another scripture, New Testament. As Jonah was in the belly of a whale, Old Testament, as Jonah was in the belly of a whale for three days, even so the Son of Man, that is Jesus Christ, earth, where? The heart of the earth, where I told you is that, for three days. Hello? So, so uh, these, but, but Matthew 27, 52 and 53, if you want to check that out. And now Paul said something else. Paul said something powerful. Now to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So man, I, I got to move on. So, I showed you the three views, the structural view, the, the, the relational view, the dynamic view. So now, at Eden, here's the second fact. At Eden, man lost the image of God in the original sin. There's no doubt about that. I think we're compelled to admit we have a universal sin problem. Amen? David said, I was born in sin and shapen in iniquity. Paul said to the Romans, for we have all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. I hate to bust some of your bubble. Luke said, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Therefore, repent and return that your sins may be wiped out uh, in order that the times of refreshing of the Lord may come from his presence. Isaiah said, but your iniquities have separated you between you and God, and your sins have hid his face from you. John declared, if you say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So let me show you the effects of our universal sin problem. Number one is alienation. I've already told you, alienation. We was alienated from God for over 4,000 years because our sin separated us from God. So somebody say, alienation, that state or experience of being isolated. 
That was the first thing. Stanley Grins, great theologian, said sin is the failure to live according to God's design. And we've done that and still do occasionally. You see, he says, therefore, because of sin, man lived and still lives in alienation from God and community is lost and our purpose left unfulfilled until such a time as we meet Christ at Calvary. So it clearly does not mean that we have no communion with God because we truly do occasionally have communion with God. God spoke to Moses face to face when Solomon dedicated the temple. Do you remember what happened? The glory of God filled the place so thick they could not even worship. They could not even stand before him. You remember when Elijah prayed 63 words and the fire of God fell out of heaven, consumed the sacrifice, licked up 12 barrels of water and the stones. You remember that? So God occasionally would talk to man, but our daily constant fellowship was gone. You see, Ezra prayed in a great confession. You see, it's abundantly obvious that sin has alienated from God, but not totally. There's still a dialogue here and there. You remember what the writer of Chronicles said, if my people... That are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, I'll heal their land. Second term I want you to get familiar with this is a result of our universal sin problem, not only alienation, but condemnation. Condemnation is a legal term whereby someone has been condemned to die. Are you with me? You see, uh, receiving a sentence of death. You know what Ezekiel said? The soul that sinneth shall die. But yes, we've all sinned. We, we know that. The remedy for sin is to accept what Jesus Christ did at Calvary and to walk in repentance. The third term I want to show you is enslavement. The term is reminiscent of a first century practice of slavery whereby an army would conquer a people and take away their freedom of choice and their freedom of autonomy and they had to obey their masters. You see, it it, it reminds me of Paul talking to the Romans. Paul said, he said, for that which I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I'm practicing, uh, what I would not like to do. He said, I find this law when I want to do right, wrong is with me. When I want to do good, bad things are there. And the good that I want to do, I sometimes don't do. And that I know I shouldn't do. Sometimes that's the very thing I'm doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. You know what he's saying? Is I have lost the image of God to a great extent. Not fully. And then there's this last term I want to show you. Uh, it's a term called depravity. If John Mayer was to sing, he'd say, depravity. <laughs> I just thought. Of... <laughs> but there's a difference in being deprived and depraved you see if I take this ink pen from you and it's yours I have deprived you of it amen if I totally crush it to pieces I've depraved you of it you know why I can't give it back to you I mean it ain't no good it's it's totally wrecked it's ruined forever the definition between deprivation or being deprived and being depraved and there are those who would say because of the loss of original righteousness and because of the original sin that mankind is depraved and there's nothing good you see nothing in us or of us that will help our condition and our sin we find ourselves in we find ourselves in a state of what the reformers called total depravity While often misunderstood, the doctrine of total depravity is the acknowledgement that the Bible teaches that as a result of the fall, every part of mankind, his will, his mind, his emotions, his flesh, all of it has been corrupted by sin and with its effects all over us. And there is none good, the Bible said. No, not one. Wow. Oh, wretched man. According to John Frame, although fallen persons are capable of externally good acts and and for good society, they can't do anything really good or pleasing to God. God, however, looks on the heart. And from this ultimate standpoint, fallen man has no goodness in him, in thought, in word, in deed. He's therefore incapable, Frame said, of contributing anything to his salvation. That's true. There's not a thing in this world I can do for my salvation 
It gives us a good understanding of total deprivation. Simply put, we cannot help ourselves. I can't help me and you can't help you. Totally depraved, you see. And what you got to understand is because the Bible says it's not by works that you've been saved. For by grace we have been saved. For by grace, he said, you have been saved through faith. That not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works. You can't work hard enough. You can't give enough money to, uh, you know, absolve your sin. You can't do that. You see, that no man should glory. You don't have enough connects. You don't have enough status. You don't have enough privilege. You don't have enough per, pers uh, persuasion or influence. You don't have enough of whatever you think you've got enough of. You don't have enough. But man cannot save himself, else we would. There's none righteous, no, not one. But here's the third fact I want you to understand. Here's the deal. At Calvary, I can regain that image. Not, it's not me. It's not what I've done. At Calvary, something can happen. See, there's none righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned. They've all went away. They're all worthless. There's no one good. No one does any good. But Paul wrote to the Romans and said, Where sin did abound, grace much more abounded. Is somebody with me? For he's the only one without sin. Jesus could redeem this fallen state because he's the only one who knew no sin. The Nicene Creed said it like this for us men and for our salvation descended from heaven and was incarnate in the Holy Ghost by the Virgin Mary and became man. He was crucified, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was buried. See, Paul said to the Galatians, it was Christ that redeemed us. From the curse of the law, having become the curse for us, Peter said, knowing that we were not redeemed with perishable things and corruptible things, but by the precious blood of a spotless lamb, John said, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, to take the book and to open the book, open the seals, for you were slain and you purchased for, you know, our salvation. So, so here's what I want you to understand. Mankind says to us, because of what, you see, this image of God, or the, I, I, we used to be able to see him in us. We could look and we say, oh, he, not only hands and feet and head and all that. We could see this image of us. We could see this image of God through us. Someone looks at Adam and says, man, I can see your dad in you. And they look at Micah and they say, I see your dad. I see your granddad. It's kind of the way it is. But sin messed that up. And they say, we were not just deprived where we were separated from God, but we were <laughs> depraved in that I can't fix it. I can't put it back together. And no matter how hard I try, no matter what I want to do, I, Mike Saints, can't never fix this image again. It is broken and ruined forever, and there's nothing I can do. And there's nothing you can do. It reminds me of an old nursery rhyme I heard years ago. He said, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. And Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And all of the king's horses and all of the king's men, there wasn't nothing they could do for Humpty. They couldn't put him back together again. But I want to tell you today, at Calvary, it is at Calvary, it is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. He can take the broken pieces. He can take the shards of glass and the image that has been marred forever and some say depraved. And he can lift you back up and put you on his potter's wheel. And he'll begin to turn that wheel again. Apply his hands to your life. And begin to take a shattered, broken, and ruined image. And make you into the image and the likeness of God again. Stand with me. You're here today and you say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I've lost the image. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, let me just say to you, sir, friend, ma'am, you're not by yourself. 
every one of us in this room lost the image of God. It wasn't just Adam and Eve that sinned. If you'd have been back there, you'd have messed it up too. If I'd have been there, I'd have probably messed it up too. But I thank God for demonstrating his love. Romans 5 and 8 says that while I was yet steeped in sin, Christ died for the ungodly. That means every sin. That means sins of lust. That means sins of molestation. That means sins of thieving and stealing. That that means whatever it is you have ever done. The blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to forgive you of your sin. And while the world tells you you will never be whole again, you will never see that image of God in that mirror again, I tell you today, I submit to you that Jesus Christ knows how to put it back together again. And some of you, this glass, and there's thousands of shards of glass, it represents fragments of your life fragments of relationships sins that you can it's innumerable I still tell you that Jesus Christ knows how to put you back together again while heads are bowed and eyes are closed if there's one person here who says pastor please pray for me I need him to put me back together again can I see your hand right now come on put them up put them up hold them high come on Come on, I want to count them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31 people. 31 people said, I can't do it. And I'm going to tell you all of us, but ain't none of us can do it. But if you said you need Jesus right now, I want you to lift your other hand with that one. To get Adam ready to sing something for me right now. I want to pray a prayer for you. And I'm going to ask God to put you back together again. I want you to be willing to open your heart and let him. Father, in the name of Jesus, we can't fix ourselves. There's none of us good, no, not one. And we have lost the image. We've lost, we don't, there's nothing good. There's nothing loving. There's nothing kind in and of ourselves. We are nothing. Isaiah said our righteousness is as filthy rags. Oh, God, but we submit ourselves to you right now. And while the world says we've been depraved and there's no fixing us, I say we've only been deprived because our sins have separated us from God. But right now we invite you into our heart. We ask you to come in, oh, Lord, and touch us and change us and fill us with your power. Put us back together again these people right now. They're praying that prayer. 31 people praying that prayer. Continue to worship him right now and just ask him to do a work in your life as Adam sings this song.